Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from CIBC Wood Gundy wades into our volatile equity markets. Sprott U.S. Holdings Chairman Rick Rule on the prospects for gold and silver. And Oil and Gas Bulletin's Keith Schaefer gives his take on the long-term future of LNG. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark, investment advisor with CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Welcome to This Week in Money. Well, it's been a very interesting week, to say the least here, Jim. In both the Canadian and U.S. equity markets. Well, and, I mean, you can then expand that across to the commodity markets and across to the currencies. It has been uh, pretty big swings. Uh, you know, we've gone from periods of very low volatility not too long ago to to expanding now. And, uh, you know, we take a, a moment here and just sort of look at all the pieces and how they're fitting together. Um, the the strength in the U.S. dollar had been, you know, such an important item, cash flowing in here uh, to um, the U.S. side. I was going to say North America, but really it's just been to the U.S. Um, and uh, during the, this last week and a half, we ended up with um, the, uh, the dollar index uh, correcting back to its November highs. And that put a nice little spurt into the precious metals. So uh, we ended up with uh, gold getting up into the uh, the 1230 range. We had a nice rally in silver, and uh, this uh, this comes after some very good oversold readings uh, five or six weeks ago in both of those markets. Now the typical rally when you have as deep an oversold reading as we did in silver. Uh, is uh, four to six weeks, and we've done just that. We're four to six weeks. The uh, precious metals, the silver gold, have managed to push up through their 50-day moving averages, which have been declining from above. That's a good thing. Uh, the mining stocks got up to their 50-day moving averages, and that would that's the norm that you get out of that hard bounce. Um, what I think will be the key moving forward right now is that we're uh, the dollar index, as long as it doesn't break back and close below those November highs at 88, then that would still be a um, put a lid and a damper on precious metals. If the dollar were to break through there, uh, we'd be looking for about a two-point break down to about 86 on the index, and that could very easily give you some strength in precious metals, probably towards the 1250 to 1265 level as far as gold is concerned. And we are in a very good, favorable period from a seasonal perspective. So we want to give the these precious metals the opportunity to move up. Um, the silver market tends to outperform gold from here through January. Uh, and what I would say to people, the uh, for silver, as long as pullbacks, hold above 1630, which is where the 20-day moving average is, I think you want to think of those terms uh, in terms of upside bias there. What about uh, the effect crude prices are having? Well, you know, it's, it's, the, 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 the crude oil market is basically falling out of bed here. Uh, we're, last week, I think we, we talked about it pushing down under 70. This week, we're under 60, uh, trading uh, around the uh, $57.5 range uh, as we uh, speak just now. Uh, did some interesting work, uh, follow up on a piece I did a number of years ago, looking at oil versus um, the um, cost of living, sort of against the CPI or the PPI, or if you look at oil versus a basket of uh, commodities, and you know we're looking to see where the bottom might be. And my favorite item to look at is actually the ratio between the oil price and the gold price. And the uh, that index, that ratio, has been running in a very, very consistent channel uh, since the 1960s. So this is since uh, Nixon took the U.S. off the gold standard and 
during the time that OPEC came into formation, um, all of the pos probable and possible manipulations in the oil and gold market during that period, which has just you know been a, a massive amount that's gone on there. And if you take a look at the chart, and once again, this is one that we'll make available to people, uh, you can see that it runs in a very, very well-defined channel. Uh, right now, um, the price of oil relative to gold, it's about 4.7%. If you take, take the old oil price divided by gold. The bottom of this channel, going back to the 1960s, is down around 4%. Uh, and each time that we've approached the bottom of the channel, uh, going back over the decades here, that has been the good low level for the oil price. Now, it's a ratio. So if you have gold move up and oil stays unchanged, the ratio is going to move then uh, in, uh, down in terms of the oil. Uh, or if we just have oil dropping and gold staying the same, you can have that ratio decline. But I think it's a, it's a dynamic item. It should be monitored because, as I say, in the past, this, this channel line that we're getting very close to has put in the important lows that we've seen in the last uh, four or five decades. Doesn't mean that we're going to rally hard. I mean, the typical action when you hit the bottom in oil is that you spend between two and four months going through a consolidation phase, and it can be fairly um, um, broad in terms of the height. Uh, typically, 20 to 30 percent swings multiple times within that uh, consolidation phase. So give people a bit of a parameter and sort of where the low might be. Uh, time frame we don't have, but price levels and ratio. Um, look, look for something in with oil trading at somewhere between four and four and a quarter percent of the price of gold. I think that's really important going forward. What about OPEC's position? Why do we have to be the ones to turn off the taps to raise oil prices again? Why can't somebody else do it this time? Well, and what they're doing is they're they're going to force others to turn off the taps. You know, you bring prices down low enough, and uh, the uh, those who are in the uh, high cost of production level are going to be forced to do it. Um, OPEC will be able to keep. Uh, themselves uh, still profitable with what they're producing and um, you you eventually take enough people out of the game and uh, prices will stabilize and start back up again. Ross, how can people get a hold of you? My uh, number here in Vancouver is 604-661-7759. And your email? Ross.Clark, that's C-L-A-R-K, at C-I-B-C.ca. Thanks a lot for being with us. Always a pleasure. Coming up, Rick Rule on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. My guest is Rick Rule. He's the chairman of Sprott U.S. Holdings. His website is sprott.com. Rick is on the line from Carlsbad, California. Welcome to This Week in Money, Rick. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. Well... People are wondering what's going to happen with gold and silver, and is it connected to our lower crude prices? I think there may be some expectation uh, of a connection. Uh, I think the root causes of the softness in gold and silver prices and the root causes of the softness in energy prices are in some substantial, some substantial measure disconnected. But I think uh, in very difficult markets like this, uh, investors who are present in both classes sort of ignore the math and go with the feelings. <laughs> and that quite often is a poor choice to make your decisions with, using your emotions rather than technical data. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, from my viewpoint, the softness in the energy prices is reflective, first of all, of the fact that markets work. We had an ex extended period of very high energy prices, and we had a period of very high energy prices, uh, a long enough period that it began to constrain demand. That is, the very fact that energy prices were high caused shifts in production technologies like three-dimensional drilling, like multi-stage fracturing, at the same time that the high prices uh, began to impact travel choices and vehicle choices. The second thing I think that impacted demand, of course, is that the... Um, <clears throat> recovery 
that people talk about, particularly in Western Europe and Japan, but also in the United States, is very, very constrained. Uh, the recovery in Europe isn't. The recovery in Japan isn't. And the recovery in the United States would seem to be to be more of a financial recovery. You haven't seen much by way of <clears throat> real wage growth in the economy. And the consequence of that is that you haven't seen, as an example, a consumer replacement and consumer durables like automobiles or heavy appliances. And without increases in demand, you aren't seeing the capital investments by industry. So the whole set of circumstances that would lead to increases in energy demand in a real recovery in a healthy economy haven't happened in the United States. And if you factor in uh, basically a no growth, a, a real no growth environment in developed nations, uh, and you combine that with a Chinese slowdown, uh, it's no wonder that energy prices finally cracked. It, is, it, it seems to me that the weakness in precious metals prices are very different. Uh, that's just a function, I think, of a strong U.S. dollar and uh, a, a function of, uh, I believe, a misplaced faith on behalf of taxpayers and voters that the economic decisions that are being made in developed nations, particularly the United States, are efficacious. There seems to be a suggestion, as an example in financial markets, that liquidity uh, near-term credit in the markets are a substance, are a substitute, pardon me, for solvency, meaning the ability of governments, including the American government, to service their debt and deficits, which I happen to believe is untrue, but I happen to be in a distinct minority. So uh, what about gold and silver stocks? Are you uh, seeing people buying them now? And what about the physical product? The physical product from every dealer I talk to, including Sprott, is flying off the shelf. Uh, people are taking advantage of these low precious metals prices to buy precious metals. We're seeing an ongoing trend there where leadership in the market is beginning to shift from futures and financial markets to retail physical markets. In other words, inventory is going from weak hands, leveraged long institutions, to strong hands, uh, individuals, and also from sclerotic economies, Western economies, to emerging economies. And that makes perfect sense. In the equity side, we have a very mixed picture. We are seeing the beginnings of concerted buying uh, from some classes, from some classes of clients, uh, in the face of panic selling from other classes of clients. We haven't seen one side begin to predominate among uh, you, you know, in that fight. The one comment I would have is that although we were pretty close, I think five or six weeks ago, to a capitulation sell-off in the juniors, we haven't seen the sort of capitulation sell-off that we saw in 2000 and before that in 1991, uh, which generally has marked the sort of climactic bottom of a bear market. It doesn't mean that we have to have a capitulation sell-off just because we had them twice before. But a capitulation sell-off would give me the courage to say that this bear market was over, and I haven't seen it yet. Now, does that apply to both gold and silver? Yes, sir. The equities, not not the not the metals themselves. I guess the the one other comment I would have is that um, you know, with regards to in particular the junior equities, but also the senior equities, although the decline in metal prices has been hard on them, the greatest wounds that the industry has suffered have been self-inflicted. The malinvestment and misinvestment that took place for 20 years, and in particular, the astonishing level of general administrative expense in the industry, uh, means that me much of the investor dissatisfaction with the industry is blamed on metals price, but ought to be blamed on poor corporate performance. The idea that the gold price could go up sixfold, in fact, sevenfold, in the period 2000 to 2011 and per share cash flows could decline uh, is just an astonishing statistic. And for some number of investors, the industry, or at least certain companies in the industries, are going to have to undergo very thoroughgoing internal reform before that sort of money returns to the market. The second comment I might have with regards to the juniors is, and I said this during the boom times on, on your show, that probably only 20% of the companies that make up the TSXV, the junior mining companies in Canada, are viable. Uh, the other 80% uh, in 
in 2011, the boom times were worth nothing. And in 2015, they are worth the same amount of money. Uh, and we need to have a gigantic shakeout in the industry. Whether we'll get it or not is a very different set of circumstances. That overrides the fact that the best companies in the sector, the best of the best, uh, are priced with the worst of the worst. And these incredible anomalies as to value in a directionless market are, and this is the, the silver lining on the cloud, uh, the real opportunities because this down cycle in precious metals will end. And veteran investors understand that bear markets like this are the authors of rip snorting bull markets. I remember that the sentiment for gold in 2000 was at least as bad as the sentiment for gold is today. And I remember the recovery from that bear market. Uh, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, uh, we didn't just have a bull market. We had a melt-up. The same thing happened in 92, 93, 94. People that have the cash and the courage in the next year, uh, in fact, going back six months, to buy the best of the best will surprise themselves in terms of how well they do. But those who buy the rest will see a portfolio that's fallen by 83% fall by another 50%. Do you have any target prices for gold and silver in the new year? Uh, I'm too too old and too smart for that. Um, I don't. With year-end tax loss selling, are the resource stocks in capitulation? Not yet. Um, you know, uh, I would love to see them go in capitulation, but no, I haven't seen capitulation yet, and I haven't seen issuer capitulation yet either, meaning I haven't seen companies that are spending $200,000 a month and have a million left in the treasury, in other words, have five months left to live. Go out and raise money on reasonable terms. So no, we aren't we aren't at capitulation yet. What kind of risk do resource stocks pose for the investor or speculator? Depends on how hard the investor and speculator wants to work. The investor and speculator that is willing to do the work, willing to do the technical work, willing to do the financial work, uh, these things are extremely low risk uh, speculations, particularly particularly low risk willing relative to the valuations that existed in the bull market. Um, five years from now, believe me, we'll be looking back at today as the good old days in terms of the opportunity set. doesn't feel like it now, but that's the way it works. For speculators that are sort of, you know, waiting blindly for an increase in the metals prices to restore their mistakes to the pricing levels that existed when they made their mistakes, uh, those people are going to lose a lot more money because most of this stuff, to be appropriately valued, would have to go to zero. And zero is never a good number. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, unless you're short, of course. What about the physical demand for gold coming from China and India? Is that going to boost prices dramatically at some point? At some point, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, people overlook the physical demand for gold and silver coming out of the United States and Canada, which is extraordinarily strong. Um China and India would appear to be the headline story. But talking to retail bullion and coin dealers around the world, there's strong physical demand in Germany. There's really strong physical demand in North America. Physical demand isn't the problem. Um, we're in pretty good shape there. And, you know, eventually, we let off this interview talking about energy markets and the fact that markets work. Extended periods of high prices were the answer to high prices. And the same thing will happen in the physical precious metals market. If you are a saver, if you are buying gold and silver for the right reasons, for insurance purposes, um, these low prices are a boon to you. And it is precisely this bargain buying that will cause the physical market ultimately to prevail over, this, over the uh, paper market. And to the extent that they keep, uh, keep on depreciating the denominator, uh, the U.S. dollar, uh, ultimately, and I suspect it won't be too far in the future, uh, somewhere between six months and 18 months, I think you'll see a crack in precious metals prices, but to the upside. What's happening with copper? Uh, same thing that's happening with energy. There's no demand. Um, you know, zinc is uh, beginning to break down a little bit, too. It, uh, you know, it, it sort of melted up last year as a consequence of tight supplies. But the demand side... Uh, across the whole range of commodities that have industrial applications is very, very, very soft. And it's very worrisome. Of course, zinc's a, a major component 
component of any battery. Electric cars now uh, a big fad that's increasing. Is that going to die down now that oil prices are so low? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I really don't. We're in a very interesting time with regards to demand. The <clears throat> equities prices, particularly in the United States, would suggest that we are into or at least at the beginnings of an economic recovery. Uh, an economic recovery would raise all ships in the commodities business because there's some supply constraints almost across commodity. The difficulty is, and I'm not an economist, I'm a credit analyst, uh, but when I look at this recovery in the United States, in fact, the recovery in all, of de all developed economies, what I'm really seeing is an interest rate driven uh, recovery in investment assets and in some cases in residential real estate. But I'm not seeing the type of recovery that would seem to me to justify the levels that you're seeing in general market securities uh, or the optimism that you're seeing with regards to a recovery. In other words, I'm not seeing real jobs growth and I'm not seeing in particular growth in workers income or disposable income or demand for things like consumer durables. So from the point of view of energy pricing and the point of view of base metals and industrial commodities, there's nothing I see in the near term that could give those things a goose. What about the darling of the past year, palladium? Is that going to still be a hot market? Um, you know, it, it, it's odd that you call it a hot market. It's a market that hasn't declined. <laughs> and I, I guess in the commodities business, that's a hot market. Uh, certainly over five years, the platinum and palladium business should be very, very, very good. They're unique, I think, in the commodity spectrum right now in the sense that uh, PGM metals are priced below the cost of production, which means either that the price goes up or the production slows dramatically. They are also metals where the supply is politically constrained. 90% of the PGMs in the world come from South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Russia, all garden spots. Um, so you have supply constraints there. And on the demand side, uh, they generate so much utility to consumers. The social question with regards to PGMs, and it's interesting, is uh, do you or do you not want more smog? I haven't seen overwhelming demand for more smog around the world. And the way that you address that is you fit internal combustion engines with catalytic converters that employ platinum and palladium. The truth is that it takes about $150 to $200 worth of platinum and palladium to sell a new vehicle in the United States, maintaining the air quality that we enjoy today. If the price of platinum and palladium were to double, in other words, uh, if you raise the input cost of a new car by $150 against a sticker price of $20,000, my suspicion is that the impact on demand would be de minimis. What that tells me is that the price of platinum and palladium must go up because the industry doesn't earn its cost of capital, and it can go up because of the price point and the utility to consumers. I would suggest to your listeners that if the price of something must go up and can go up, that it will go up. I just can't tell you over what time frame. Is there going to be a surprise in the metals at any time over the next year? I don't know about over the next year. I, I don't know. Um, I'm, uh, as I say, I'm really a credit analyst. I'm not a, um, uh, I'm not an economist. Um, uh, this I can tell you. Uh, this is my fourth cycle where I was cognizant of cycles, and I can absolutely positive, positively tell you that the resource businesses, because they're so capital intensive, are extraordinarily cyclical. And bull market, pardon me, bear markets are absolutely positively the authors of bull markets. And a class that is this severely hated, uh, where there's ongoing demand for the product, must be owned. It must be owned. But it can only be owned by those that have the cash and the courage to stay the trade. And people that have enough aggression, naked aggression, that they're do, willing to do the work to segregate between the good, the bad, the ugly in terms of choices on the equity side. What about governments who feel that they have a handle on the economies and they can just switch on and off things like uh, quantitative easing to keep control of it? Well, I think that I, I think that the vast majority of taxpayers and investors want to believe that that's true. Uh, I happen to think it's silly. Uh, governments can't educate the kids; they can't deliver the mail. 
uh, they can't win wars on terrorism, drugs, or poverty. Uh, how can they fine-tune a market? That appears to me to be absolutely silly. But I'll tell you this. Um, people's expectations of the future are set by their experience in the immediate past. And their experience in the immediate past is that equity markets are going up, interest rates are going down, and the big thinkers of the world, the Carnies, uh, the um, Yellens, the Obamas, and the Merkels, uh, are given credit by voters and by investors for helping us survive the 2008 financial crisis. I don't think they did it. I think they forestalled it. Uh, but that doesn't matter. Uh, I, I think most people would prefer to believe that the big thinkers are responsible for their financial future. It takes the onus and the responsibility off of them. So if your orientation is to hope that the big thinkers can make this work, and your experience in the immediate past is that they have done so, uh, until something happens to shatter that confidence, my suspicion is that fiat currencies, in particular the U.S. dollar, will continue to be the rage. And hedges against the U.S. dollar, i.e. precious metals, will be subdued. Uh, I am reminded that George Soros said that he built his fortune by finding broadly held public precepts that were wrong and betting against them. Betting against the pound in 1990 uh, is an example. Uh, and my own belief is that the efficacy of fiat currencies and government management of the economy is a broadly held public perception that is historically wrong. But I can't tell you when I will be proven right. Rick, thanks a lot for chatting with us. A pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. My guest has been Rick Rule, chairman of Sprott U.S. Holdings. His website is Sprott.com. After the break... Founder of the Oil and Gas Bulletin, Keith Schaefer, next on This Week in Money. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. My guest is Keith Schaefer, founder of the Oil and Gas Investment Bulletin, and you can find it on the web at OilAndGas-Investments.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, Keith. Jim, thanks for having me on. Well, oil prices, the big thing that everybody's talking about and what it might do to the local and national economies. But first of all, maybe uh, tell us about your newsletter. Well, the newsletter really is an independent voice out there in, in, in stock land. You know, you got all these investors looking for good information, and the brokerage firms, Jim, get paid to convince you to buy stocks of their corporate clients. That's what the brokerage firms do. So what I do is try and give a lot more independent view because I just use my own portfolio as the rule for where stocks should be bought. So I'm really trading my own personal portfolio and explaining to people what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And so they get to see what somebody who studies the industry full time is buying and selling. And so it's not a case of yell and sell. You're actually explaining why you feel about certain things and are giving some background to it. Yeah. I, I, like whenever we first do a trade, we'll maybe put out half a page of copy, but then if it's a if it's a company we really like, we'll we'll go and follow it up with as much as a fifteen to twenty page report. And all this stuff is put in like real simple English. I look at all the different analyst reports and I talk to management myself and sometimes I even fly out to Calgary and meet them and then uh put all that into a really easy to understand, no words over nine letters report. Canadian and oil and gas, where are we headed? Well, I I think we're we're definitely headed lower here for the short term. You know what what I tell people is that really there's two issues here with this collapse in the price of oil. One is short-term and one is long-term, and they're not really that related. Uh, because short-term, what's happened, Jim, is you've put on a lot of debt corporately at these companies at higher cash flows and, and higher oil prices. And then investors have put on these big um, hedge positions. Investors have, have bought these all these call options and put options and, and uh, futures contracts at much higher prices. And until... All that washes out. You know, th there really is no bottom on the on the price of oil right now. So, so what you're getting is is almost what I call the tail wagging the dog, where you've got a lot of financial derivatives around oil, uh, really sending the price down much farther than it probably deserves to be. Because really, what what we're seeing now, Jim, fundamentally doesn't warrant a 45 percent drop in the price of oil because we now only have a supply. We're, we're oversupplied in the market right now by about a million barrels, maybe at most a million and a half barrels. 
Well, we use 90 million barrels a day. Like, that's only 1.1 to 1.5 percent. So that's not a lot. And yet the price of oil has dropped 40 percent. So that's, that's a very small difference in fundamentals, making a huge difference in price. But a lot of that's because of the, those financial derivatives that surround oil. And how do those derivatives affect the price? Well, what, what happens is, is that it, a, a lot of people were long oil. It was a very crowded trade. So when you sell those oil contracts and say, okay, just get me out, that actually does have an impact on the physical price of the, of the commodity. It's, it, the, those financial derivatives don't live in their own insulated space. Uh, so all these contracts have been bought saying that we think oil is going to go higher. And when now that it's not going higher, people are being forced out of those trades and being forced to sell them at whatever the bid is. And the street knows that, so they just lower the bids. So that that's kind of what, what, what what's happening here. And it's been pretty painful to watch, as everyone can see. Apart from derivatives, what else is uh, pressuring oil to go down? Well, obviously there is there is a fundamental issue here, and, and that is that we are being oversupplied right now, as I said, by just over a million barrels a day, and that's uh, really that that caught the market a little bit by surprise because even though the Saudis had said for quite a while we don't we don't plan on cutting production, the street really didn't believe them because the, the Saudis have been very good over the last four years at being the swing producer and reducing or increasing supply to keep oil very steady at $100 a barrel. So the street thought that they would do that again this time. And so at the November 27th OPEC meeting, when the Saudis said, no, we're not going to do that, we are not going to cut production, because a year ago they increased production a little over a million barrels a day when Libya went offline. And now that Libya is back up, they like Libya went from about 1.7 million barrels a day to almost nothing. And now they've come back to pretty much a million barrels a day. And so everyone thought the Saudis would just take a back seat on that million barrels, but they didn't. So that's really the reason we have very cheap oil right now. Does it have anything to do with pressure on Putin? Well, you know, there's so much talk about what's the geopolitical angle here. And honestly, I think the geopolitical angle is an effect, not a cause. I think the Saudis see one of their major customers, the states, is pretty much self-sufficient now. Uh, they don't need a lot of light oil imports. So the Saudis, they only import now, the Saudis only export about 750,000 barrels a day to the states, and, and half of that is for their own refinery in Texas. So the states imports about 7 million barrels a day, so the Saudis are about 10% of that. And so they're, they're seeing that everybody else, like Nigeria and Angola and all these other African countries that used to export to the United States, uh, they're having to, you know, now sell to Europe and Asia, which are the, the other Saudi customers. So I think the Saudis just said, you know what, enough is enough. And I, I don't think Putin had a lot, or, or even Iran, their arch enemy, had a lot, was it was a big part of their consciousness when they decided to do this. They, I think they really needed to show, they wanted to show the Americans, look, you just can't keep increasing production at a million barrels a day every year, year over year, which is what they've been doing. Do the Saudis feel, why is it always our responsibility to reduce production to bring prices back up? Oh, absolutely. The, 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 their language is so clear about that. Uh, and, you know, they, they went to Russia. Uh, they, they went to other places to say, would you be willing to cut back production? And everybody else said, no, you, you cut back production because you got that extra three million barrels last year. And the Saudis says, no, we're not, we're not going to do that. So... That's right. The, the Saudis absolutely feel like everyone's putting it all on them. Iran has said it's comfortable with forty-dollar oil. What does that do for everybody else? Well, a the Saudis aren't comfortable with forty-dollar oil. The, the, they might say that, and I would call them a liar to their face. Uh, nobody's comfortable with forty-dollar oil. Uh, I, I, I think the part of the, the it, it really hurts the other basket economies, basket case economies that are in OPEC, like Venezuela and Ecuador, and like Venezuela is only a few short weeks away from some pretty severe civil unrest, I'd suggest. And, and um, it, it, those countries are going to cry uncle, I think, before the states does. But they, they don't have any choice. They just have to keep producing to get any kind of cash flow they can in the door. So everybody hurts, Jim. Like, everybody hurts. And and even the shale guys, you, you hear guys like Harold Hammond Continental saying, oh, you know, we we can grow at 50 bucks a barrel. 
You know what, buddy? That, that's great for you to talk like that, but I don't think so. I, 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 I think you're going to be wrong. What kind of pressure are the crude prices putting on natural gas? Well, in, in one sense, they're, they're, they're a little bit unrelated, but um, certainly for LNG, though, they're very related because uh, liquid natural gas, which now is, is, ju- is just growing in leaps and bounds around the world, uh, you know, it has been traditionally priced, Jim, at 13% of Brent. So at, you know, when it's Brent's $100 a barrel, that's obviously $13 an MCF for, uh, for a thousand cubic feet of, um, of liquid natural gas. But now when gas or oil today is at 58, uh, which basically makes for $6 gas, uh, LNG just doesn't work. Like it's, it's, it's pretty tough to make that work. So, um, you, you, you know, before this interview, I should have checked to see what, what, what the international price is. It's called JKM, which stands for like Japan, uh, Korea, Malaysia or something. Um, and, and, but I know it's, it's been down right at the cusp of profitability, right in the $11 range. And really, like margins are super thin there, Jim, for liquid natural gas at those prices. So oil has definitely had an impact on LNG. And, and that really could be one of the reasons that up in, uh, BC that Petronas uh, decided to put a halt on things for now. Of course, uh, Asia's economy is still growing. It's single digits now. We were used to double. Will they still be the ones who will demand liquidified natural gas in the future? Absolutely. They'll continue to be the big buyers. You know, you, you know, your four biggest buyers are over there, China, South Korea, Japan, and Taiwan. So the, they make up the bulk of the market, and, and nothing's changing there. You know, there's been some pretty high-profile deals signed with Russia, but those things will all take time. So LNG is still going to be the source of fuel for most of those countries for the next three to five years. But the deals that were expected to go through, say, today or within the next six months, are going to be delayed because of the low price. It could be. You know, you know, Jim, certainly uh, I think there's a couple things to think about. And, and one is that you know these are very large companies who are about to spend $20 billion dollars at a place like Prince Rupert, they can't think short term. So they have to understand that they're going to kind of get through, have to go through several cycles, highs and lows, the business trough, the business cycle. And the other thing is that, you know, the, the Asian end users are part of the consortiums in each of the major plays off Canada's West Coast. And they just want the gas. They're actually not that uh, they're definitely price elastic. If it's if it's much higher price, they're gonna probably take less. But they're out is that they don't want to get all their gas from Russia and Qatar. They're willing to pay to have a diversified source of liquid natural gas, uh, maybe even on a on a cost plus basis if the market's really bad, just to have those different sources of supply to make sure they're not at the whim of uh, oligarchs or uh, dictators like Putin. You know, Putin's shown very clearly what with Europe what he's willing to do with gas and, and use it as a political weapon. And well, twice that, he's turned off the gas to Ukraine in the middle of winter. Exactly. He's done that twice. So, you know, that, that doesn't go unnoticed in Asia. So that that's why I'm still pretty confident we are going to see LNG uh, off Canada's west coast, even though right now the economics at today's prices are razor thin, if not even negative, for the profit column. But this is only a short-term blip, I think. So so it's still important for the province to encourage people to get training to take part in this industry because it is going to be there, and quite often the training does take quite a while to be, say, a, a high-pressure pipeline technician. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 we'd be crazy to be thrown in the towel just yet. You know, the, the reality is that uh, Petronas does a lot of their negotiating in the media. They have a big history of that with us here on the West Coast. This latest thing really is, I, I think, directed mostly at the Fed's gym, because what, what Petronas really needs to make this super economic now uh, is a faster depreciation schedule in their accounting from the Fed. So if the Feds allow them to do that, that basically takes their payback time from like eight years to four years. And so it makes a big difference in, in when they basically get to start having profits and um that's that's what I really think this delay from Patronus is all about. We'll have more with Keith Schaefer next on This Week in Money. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. 
Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking to Keith Schaefer, founder of the Oil and Gas Bulletin. So basically, Keith, what you're saying is you're still optimistic about the long-term prospects for B.C. liquefied natural gas. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I don't think anyone should be too concerned just yet. If, if we don't see anything by May, I'm going to be really concerned, really concerned. But honestly, before March, I, I, would, um, I wouldn't think we're going to see very much. How are the gasoline and diesel markets being affected? Well, well, obviously they're coming down. Ga- gasoline in the states, in particular, is uh, under under the magic two dollar level, which is just beautiful. Uh, here in Canada, we're we're down under a buck a liter almost everywhere in the country. So, um, you know, here in Vancouver, we have the highest gas prices in in Canada, but we're um, at a at a buck ten. But you know, there's lots of places in the prairies now in Alberta that are seeing sub one dollar gas per liter, which uh, we haven't seen for a long time. Big question I'm asked. People wonder why are diesel prices now so much higher than gasoline? Well, you know that's a great question, and and that's been the case. My my, my dad asked me that uh, all the time, and and uh, the big difference, Jim, is exports. You know, the the, the rest of the world really runs on diesel. So uh, Europe, but particularly Asia, runs on diesel, not not regular gasoline. So we now export so much of our cheap diesel overseas that uh, we basically have to pay export world prices. So it used to be a 10, 15 cent a liter discount is now at almost a 20 cent a liter premium uh, for diesel. And that's because we export so much more diesel around the world. Because we, we have the cheapest gasoline in the world, right, uh, in, in North America. So it, for the most part, it's way cheaper for other countries to buy our diesel and import it. Yeah, my dad wondered, he lives in Peace River, and he said, we're right in the middle of the oil patch. How come we have a diesel shortage? Well, mostly because it's got to go, half the time it's got to go to the Gulf Coast to get refined and then ship back. But What are these lower crude prices going to mean to economies like Alberta and northern B.C.? It's going to be tough, Jim. It's going to be really tough. Now, you know, um, there's a couple things to consider here. One is that the oil price has already dropped. So uh, that means... In one sense, that operating costs should drop, but uh, obviously for oil sands, um, which is a huge employer, all ac- and, and, and the spill uh, uh, spill out effect of that is, is huge. So th- I, I don't see. I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that the a lot of the oil sands production, it, the capital is already paid for. So I don't think we're going to see any big layoff schemes out of that. But uh, anything new is going to be put on the shelf, and we've already seen two plays get put on the shelf this last 12 to 18 months. And so I think a lot of the stuff is just going to go to maintenance capital, uh, not so much expansion capital. But um, I, I think that uh, the other shoe that's going to drop here, Jim, that's really going to hurt Alberta and Northeast BC is natural gas prices. Like, uh, we're now producing so much gas, uh, the, the states is, that, that they just don't need our gas near as much. And I, I'm really nervous that without a very cold winter that happens, like, almost immediately, we're going to see crazy low natural gas prices, uh, like under $2 an MCF. So they've been hanging around 4 bucks for the last year, but they, they're starting to crack now. And uh, even with Western Canada having lower than normal storage, you know, Jim, the, the Yanks are just producing so much gas. They've increased production this year by over 10%. So they're now producing about 72 billion cubic feet a day of gas. Canada produces about 13 billion cubic feet, and we send about 3 to 5 billion a day uh, down south in exports. But that number has been coming down. We used to send 8 to the states. Now we send 5. And our own production has been dropping but now it's starting to increase. So that's just everywhere you turn, Jim, there's more natural gas being produced. So I'm a little nervous that we are going to see, uh, and I'm actually quite certain about this next spring after winter, we're going to see some really ugly low gas prices. And that's really going to hurt Alberta because now you've got um, um, the oil price being very low, gas prices being very low. So what's interesting to me is that over the last three years, the worst job in the oil patch has been HR human resources, trying to find qualified guys who can drive in snow, who can work the rigs, who can put up with the conditions and still do great work. That's been really tough for for both the producers and the service companies. 
I don't think that's going to be a problem for much longer. Uh, I, I just think that by next summer, uh, you're, you're going to see a real loosening of the labor market and, and higher unemployment across Western Canada. Keith, uh, maybe explain again how people can get your newsletter and find out more about this. Sure. So uh, we're online at www.oilandgas-investments.com. And so, Jim, we don't just have the, the paid subscription service for stock picking. On the website, we post uh, a couple times a week free stories about whatever's interesting me in the oil patch. So we've, uh, if we see a research report from one of the major brokerage firms, we'll uh, do a story on that, uh, and there's a great one on there right now about how Canadian gas prices uh, are looking to be about a buck forty or a buck fifty uh, this time next year potentially. And like I say, right now it's about three eighty, so that's a big drop. And one of the, one of the Canadian brokerage firms is incredibly bearish on that. And and so it, it, it's a great way for investors just who don't really know much about the oil patch to read some of this information and get up to speed on how things work. In, in layman's terms. Thanks a lot again for speaking with us, Keith. Jim, God bless you. My guest has been Keith Schaefer, founder of the Oil & Gas Bulletin. That wraps up our show for this week. Thanks to our guests, Ross Clark, Rick Rule, and Keith Schaefer. And thank you for listening. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. 